correct. Yeah. I've got, got it. Right, got it. Oh, Sorry, I must good. get my... Are you good? Rest. Yeah, okay. All right, so uh, I'll just... What time is it? It's almost time. Oh, yeah, it's time. Yeah. And I don't like to waste time. So, hello, everyone, and welcome to ED Speaks. As we continue our conversation on the Jack Bar series. And in case you don't know, and you're wondering what Jack Bar is, Jack Bar is, uh, I hope I pronounced it right, Jack Bar. Jack Bar is a Yoruba term that means to escape. And truly and honestly speaking, a lot of our people from the continent are escaping. But what are they escaping to? For better opportunities, for greener pastures. But escaping comes with a lot of challenges, and most of them are mental and emotional health challenge. Well, challenges. In Canada, approximately 29% of immigrants would complain about or have reported about emotional and mental health. And 16% of them would say they have high stress levels. In the UK, 23% of Black and Black Irish people will, would, would experience a form of mental health breakdown within a given week. And evidence suggests that people from the ethnic minority are most likely or are at a higher risk of developing mental health challenges and are unfortunately less likely to receive the support that they need. And that is why on EP Speaks today, my team of experts will be talking about how we can pre will tell you how you can protect your mental health as a migrant community. And so welcome to EB Speaks. I'm your host, Ibinabo Enebi. And uh, listen, if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, please subscribe. And you can be a part of this conversation by leaving your comments if you're watching the YouTube the uh, Facebook, the LinkedIn on the comment page or the comment section, and I'll try as much as possible to read out your questions so that my guests can answer them. So welcome to EB Speaks once again. And I have my special guest, Miriam Adeni. Miriam! And Dr. Jeff Ijoma from... Yeah. Hi. Yeah, hi. So before we start this whole conversation, I would like you to please introduce yourselves. So I'll start with Jeff. Jeff? Oh, right. I'm Jeff Ijoma. Um, so I'm a psychiatrist, consultant, uh, forensic psychiatrist. Um, so I... I do that job is really, when I do that job, I find that my clients that end up in, say, high security hospitals have often had social disadvantage, <laughs> yeah, and might have been uh, from uh, immigrant populations, or, yeah. And, but I also uh, work with a charity that provides support to, in you know, internally displaced people uh, in Nigeria. So it's often people that are driven from their land due to armed conflict. And so some of the um, areas I've learned from that is both supporting people who are forced to migrate mm -hmm. and using that to help people who, as it were, choose to migrate. There's the same kind of traumas and the same kind of um, strategies to support them. Yeah, that's me. Okay, so you support people who are forced to migrate and yeah. people who have decided or have made the decision to migrate. Yes. So, unfortunately, the traumas that we go through as people who have migrated by mm -hmm. error, by style, or by design mm -hmm. is the same. Is the same that whole um, process of almost being uprooted from the land, the geography, 
the social context, your friends, your status in one community ah, to relocate to another yeah. is, um, is the same kind of traumas. The benefit, if, if somebody then chooses to undergo that, say a transition, a mm -hmm. challenge where you get through those traumas, is very useful if you, you have a choice so you can prepare for it. That's the advantage. Some people, they've got no choice. They have to run in the middle of the night from an ambush <laughs> to run for their lives for safety. It's a different process. Run for their lives for the safety. Yeah. Thank you. And we're going to learn more from you. Miriam, yeah. tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, the, the, your, um, it's not loud. Your, your, the volume of your set isn't loud. Let me see if I can increase mine. Okay. Do you want to check the volume of your speaker? Okay. Is it better? Yeah. No, maybe not. Hello, everyone. Hi, Latifat. Latifa, we're introducing we're doing it to a talk show. <laughs> oh, so yeah, Miriam. Yes, can you hear me now? Is yeah, but you need to speak up a bit more. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, you know, it's a great honor to be here today. My name is Miriam Adeni. I'm a psychologist. I practice with um, the EAP and I have a private practice. And I practice with the BTI, as a collective group of black therapists that come together to give people of color, not necessarily black, how to be able to give them therapy, low-cost therapy, therapy, outside of our uh, practices. So, and uh, I work with refugees a lot. Majority of the clients that I would have would be refugees of our people and class race. So that is it today. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Miriam. Oh, but we have to... That your um your your mic isn't capturing your lovely voice, and I know that you would have a lot to say. So maybe whilst um Dr. Joma is going to be speaking, maybe we should try to adjust your the volume of your mic. So um yesterday we had a pre-event meeting, and I wish I recorded that pre-event meeting because it was a lot that we learned yesterday. So, I want us to start by, by painting a picture of what happens when a migrant leaves his country or her country or their country. Um, Dr. Joma, you said that some people are forced to leave their countries. They are forced and some people yeah. leave their countries by choice. Yes. So when people leave their country to another country, what are the things that they are most likely to experience that they didn't anticipate they were going to experience? Yes, that, that's a, a very good question. And um, Often, say, um, people that choose to migrate, right, are, they have to think about the reasons that led them, you know, almost like to leave homeland and from a very settled life. So that there's that. 
So they're embarking on the journey. So it's very good that they're, you know, get very clear in their mind why they were making that choice. Often, you know, one analogy I use is to almost like compare it to a hero's journey. There's something that um, that they feel that they lack in hmm. where they are. Hmm. So they make this choice to obtain that other thing somewhere else. Yeah. And for some people, it might be better life circumstances for their children, their future. It's often that there's something um, they crave and they're willing to go on a journey to search, seek and find it. Yeah. So, so it's always very good that they're clear on that because that will guide them on that journey. And um, often there will be a period where they prepare to make that journey, get all the resources they feel they need, do their research to find out where it's good to go, what are the opportunities. So there's a process of getting ready hmm. um, and that kind of readiness. And yeah. then there will be a process where they... Um, so as this is the other thing to get, that as they're getting ready to almost like give up what they have in their home country for the possibility that they might get this thing they desire somewhere else that means a change of um, uh, a change of geographical location. Um, they will often have built up their confidence where they're ready to take that step. So you can think that, that they're they're at the top of their game, they're very settled, and to almost like um, for the ultimate kind of self-fulfillment, they're willing to risk this challenge, yeah? And using that analogy, so they're almost like if there's a concept of Maslow's hierarchy. So at the, tri at the bottom of the triangle is the basic needs that everybody needs just to survive, food, housing, shelter. As you progress, uh, the social relationships that support you, and then at the p pinnacle is that kind of self-actualization. So these people um, going in that journey are, are near the top of the self-actualization. They're risking what they've already achieved to go somewhere else to achieve even more. And using that concept, then when they transfer, when they break that bar barrier, move to a different geographical location, what they've got to realize is that their identity will change. They're no longer top of their game. Hmm. They're at the bottom of the hierarchy. And the challenges that they never expect, if they've did the research, they will be prepared for. But is basic things of enough money for food? How do we find housing? You know, yeah, things like um, if you're not, if you're new to a country, there's no credit ratings, so you can't get access to housing. You have to stay in hotels. All these things, um, even access to schools, you have no geographical identity in that country. So there's all these unexpected barriers. Uh, the transportation costs might be different, you know. Um, the rules, uh, you know, is like um, if, you know, the laws are different in different countries, if your qualifications are valid, if your driving license is recognized, all things like that, you know. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, yep. sorry, sorry to cut you short because I have to give... Um, uh, Mariam opportunity to speak mm. however you know there's something that you've said that we don't think about people don't think about when they want to relocate so for example I'm in Nigeria and all I see is 
the problems in Nigeria. I'm at the top of my game. Yeah, a lot of people are. And I don't see, I all I see is I want to get out of here. And then I leave. What we don't realize is that we would now come to a new country and in spite of the fact that we were already on a certain level, we have to come down and start from the from the beginning. And sometimes your qualifications are not recognized. And sometimes your experiences are not recognized. So even if you've had such an intimidating CV, or so to speak, when you come here or you relocate to another country, all of those things, like it never existed. So you have to start from the bottom up. Thank you, Dr. Jeff. Um, Miriam, uh, Jeff has uh, hit the nail on the head, but I know that you have yeah. something you want to add to this whole thing. People of to to go to this other country. For people that make conscious decisions, Say, you know what? I've had enough of this country. I'm moving. I'm seeking greener pasture. It is a conscious decision. That for one reason or another had to up and leave everything and live with just the clothes on their back and their lives. For such people, Whoever or whatever they were, is correct. It's one, maybe, or whatever certificate and or what not they have been acquired is going to say war, they flood in, say fire, and the right of things going to you know, prompt to drive people to say, I'm seeking refuge. And it's part of it that I'm playing. End up becoming refugees in the country where they find themselves. And as refugees, we all know what the story is around the world, what is happening to people. It is a sad, sorry situation. But it doesn't matter who you are. Jeff said that, that you start from the scratch. For people like that, you don't even have. Ground level to start from. You start from below scratch. Because then you have to walk your way through to the ground level. And this brings a lot of trauma. It causes a lot of trauma. Considering the traumatic experiences they've had from the country of origin and coming into this new environment where one they are just a number. They are not even regarded as secure and they don't have a And even in the Western world, they that make it to the Western world, we hear what is happening in refugee camps and centers. They are treated as equal as humans. They, they can't even be equal because nobody, because they, nobody can do that. But they are less than human in this new environment. And this brings the kid a lot of issues, mental issues, physical issues, emotional issues, economical issues. Hmm. Limit. So, it is unfortunate that when we, for those that make conscious decision to leave, to say, I'm open, I'm going to stay green and pasture. They don't notice on the other side of the field because everyone believes he's greener on the, on the other side of the field. But I have, when they get there, reverse is the case. Even with, for those that prepare, for those that brought their CVs and all of that. 
Perfect. I hear what you're saying. And one of the things that you've just said that just it resonates with me and just takes me back is the fact that a lot of people, when they relocate, so maybe they must have had traumatic experiences in their countries. Um, they've had bad experiences, whatever it, is, whatever it is. And they've also had childhood traumas and traumas experience and traumas that have come about by experiences. Yeah. So they have the traumas from their home countries and then they now leave their home countries and relocate. And in getting to where they want to get to, first is the, is the shock. And first is the, is the starting from the scratch. And so they acquire all the new sets of trauma. So you have the migrant now having trauma, the trauma from home and trauma from his new country of abode. So one person has two different sets of traumas playing in him. So um, Dr. Joma, I want us to, because this particular episode is for people who are thinking about coming and for people who are already, have already relocated. So what are some of the types of setbacks or challenges that the ethnic, that well, that, that the immigrant would experience when they come into a new country? Um. Yeah. Um, so so what, I, what I'm trying to do is like a lot of people coming is just to be warned and have that preparation so it comes across quite positive. So what I'm trying to do is to kind of give that, say, an understanding of um, some things that people experience um, when they do that transition to move to another country so that... Um, when they experience it, they understand what's happening and it's not um, confused for them. Um, so, so we talked about that switch from somebody who'd been very confident when they make the decision to voluntarily leave their, their country and also linking that. So the change of the geography the friendships, their social friendships, and their status as, I say, a high achiever. Mm. That, so realizing that when they switch country, they won't be at that high status is one thing. So it's not like a, sh a total shock. And realizing that their tasks are the basic things so that that isn't a total shock, that they have to... Uh, put together um, a roof over their head that's stable for them, their children, um, secure source of income, food, before they can even pass go. Yeah. And so it, it doesn't become a shock that a lot of their time is devoted doing to these basic things because those are the necessary foundations before they are able to move on. One is the thing about because they're lose sorry, um, leaving the social crowd and support systems, you know, and moving to another country is then they've got to realize they should expect um, to feel kind of sad, isolated. Hmm. Some, yeah. And it's almost like saying um, that, you know, that they shouldn't take it personally. You're kind of leaving somewhere that you love. You might be leaving your mother, the all the support systems for childcare. Right? Mm, yeah. So when people are feeling, oh, why am I so sad? What's wrong with, it's not personal. It is that you've left something, it's almost like a grief. You've broken attachment with something that you love. So if you're human, you will feel sad, yeah? Yeah. And so it's just to um, to expect that and not take it personally and not feel that they 
that there's something wrong with them. Why did this always happen to me? So it's, th it's those types of things. And also because, um, because it is a challenge and there are obstacles, so it's natural to feel a bit fearful, hmm. sometimes panicky. And if you know that's happening, then it allows you to switch the mindset to say, oh, this is because I'm taking on a challenge. And the fear, the palpitations, the fast breathing are the energy from the challenge. If I can, if I don't allow, if I have the mindset, I don't allow the fear to paralyze me, I can use it as energy to mount to um, tackle the challenge. It's those types of things. Yeah, like I, I was just reading that the WHO says that refugees and migrants often face feelings of anxiety, sadness, hopelessness, difficulty sleeping, fatigue, irritability, anger, and physical discomfort. So uh, Miriam, when a migrant feel all feels all of these things, what should they do with these experiences? It is easy for me to sit here and say, seek help. Do everything within your power. But the reality of what should do. You find people who let's focus now on refugees, but for a refugee in the refugee camp, their mental, their mental health well -being is, is not considered with what it's not, it's, they're not it's up to just be organizing the providers of this as well to be able to give them this good life, this so called good life it's, that, they, that, that, that they are running towards or better life that they're running towards. So we find that in these camps, that even for those that are not in camps, that that have been settled. Let's say black refugees or black migrants. They are never taken serious. And you find that because black people are very resilient race set of people. They are never taken serious. Mental health, physical health, emotional health, and otherwise. So, for these people that are in these communities, that are in these camps, in these refugee centers, I would say the certain people of lack of same race or that understand where this is coming from should strive to volunteer if they can or work for less like we in BTI do that we are of the pace of fraction of what our rate should but it's not about the money it's about the well being of this person in front of you this people in this community this people in this tense it's about the, their well being. And like I mentioned earlier, every individual has a natural weapon in life. Even a child that is born today is traumatized by child but by, by, by their birth. They are traumatized. And with some children, it sits with them. Even though it, it got nothing to do with them, it sits with them and they grow with it. That is the trauma that should be done, even on. And then fast forwarding, primary school, secondary school, maybe even university, they graduated. They've seen one or two things along the way. They've been taught one or one way or another along the way. And now that trauma is hidden because in Africa, I'll tell you, just get off and if you're and 
carry the strength that we should need, that we don't need to carry. We feel we should have the strength to face the world, even when we should just lay there and say, I need help. This moment, um, you are faced with in this new place that is maybe magnified by tech, is in the body, and you find for families that maybe a mother that is basically a mother that has children that is still in the process, the immigration process or refugee process, and all of that. She doesn't know when. Because we realize she doesn't know she be thrown back to where she's coming from. You see, she'll be she become snappy, she'll become irritable, she'll become everything but what a mother should be to their child. She's extending the that to those children. She cursed at every, every given opportunity. For such people, what can we do? It's just education to say you are important, you are valued, you are things that you get. Something that all you need to hear. Say, I see you, I hear you, I understand you. And let's give them as much, as many, as little as they can in taking care of their mental well being. Mm -hmm. Because when the world is affected, it will be well with the body. Well, on the, oh gosh, I was really okay. So, what you've said that hit me again is the children that come on a, on a comp on a company. They are the young children, so they experience even the trauma primary school, secondary school, university, and all of that. Yeah. So that kind of like, ha that with some kind of a pain or a feeling of hopelessness in them. And I, and I, I, I and I feel that if somebody goes through all those type of pains and everything, I, I don't think the person can, can be normal. Yeah. I don't, I don't think so. It is, it is not possible to be normal, but what is normal? I don't know. Is, the, the reality is we can heal. Everyone can heal. Even the most traumatized person with adequate treatment, adequate therapy, adequate medication, adequate love. Good sanitation, good environment, good home, good school, good community. Everyone can heal. It could take long, longer for a lifetime of work for others. But we can all heal. Everyone can heal. Yeah. Dr. Jeff, do you have anything to add? Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Dr. Jeff, do you have anything to add? I, I think. Um, like with Marion says, it's it, it's amazing how resilient children are. <laughs> you know, um, you, you they are very very resilient. And saying the internal displaced charity we have, you can you imagine that there are many unaccompanied children, and often it's when say a, a whole community is driven out from their homeland and say their parents are, you know, unfortunately killed. And so they can, as un, un, they do, um, so it's often a whole social group that is displaced. So there are unaccompanied children. And because um, what we find is that because it's things like art therapy, because often the trauma might be happening uh, at time, depending on the level that we're able to speak. So some things are kind of pre-verbal. So often art therapy through drawing allows them to communicate and it's, but they're, they are very resilient. So it's not the, um, they can very overcome childhood trauma. It's, it, it's only when that trauma is like enduring, you know, years and years. 
And I, I can give one example of um, um, the Roman, uh, sorry, the Romanian um, um, children that were, as it were, so uh, the background is in, under Ceausescu, one of the communist dictatorships in Romania, there's a policy to increase the number of uh, children born, thought more children increase the kind of birth rate, stronger country. So a lot of the benefits were made to almost promote families having more children. They were having more children, but they couldn't look after them. So the children were going straight into uh, children's homes. There are so many, the, the neglect was astronomical. And so when with the fall of Ceausescu, a lot of these children were fostered abroad. So there's a follow-up study done, and some of these um, follow-up study done, and sp especially with the ones in Britain that were fostered there, at age 18, 21, but 99% recovery, people could go to education. The trauma might just be of, say, flashback when certain food is presented, the, you know, like the smell of buzzing flies, because the, as a reminder in those homes, they were just covered in excrement and not really looked after. But the, there's one about the length of the trauma. So those that, it was even like had human contact it's, you know, just, it might just be briefly. They that was a predictor of um, recover, you know, of you know resilience. Another human being showed them kindness during that period, whilst as those that had like sustained um, neglect, often not even been spoken to. When you do like scans of their of their brains, you actually see that there's holes or deficits in the kind of um, language, the areas of the brain that are for language and communication. They never developed it and therefore kind of ne never will. So what I'm saying is that neglect, even like attention that's so severe that causes um, you, parts of the brain that you need for communication not to develop. Even when they're talking, even when they're able to speak. It, you know, so say some of the earliest communication is pre probably a child being held by their mother and it's the child looking into the mother's eyes. Is that when they don't even have that, they're just left in a cot, you know, you know, of, of, often with malnutrition is that severity of neglect. But what, what proves that they can be quite resilient is that even enduring that, the human contact they get, mm -hmm. you know, if it's not too prolonged neglect, by age 18, 21, they've recovered from that. You know, so that's what the Romanian refugee, you know, Romanian... Uh, children that were adopted very early on in Britain, um, of, often when they're adopted, then they get good, um, you know, parental care. So with that, they're able to recover from very severe neglect. So this idea that, you know, early childhood trauma is always damaging. Th there's a notion that young children are very, very resilient and can overcome the most severe traumas. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Gemma, for that. And I'll, and I'll take us to the next questions that I want to ask. So, um, again, like back home in Africa or wherever you are migrating from, India, uh, anywhere, a lot of times the people who migrate, who leave their countries, obviously leave for better opportunities, yeah? But there is a deficit of our social capital on both sides of the divide. So I'm leaving my mother, my sisters, my friends. I have, my leaving is a deficit on their social capital. 
And when I relocate to the new country, because I haven't built up enough, I'm new, I have a deficit of social capital as well. So that also affects my mental health. So what I now a lot now we're looking at the mental health situations of people that are actually relocated. What about the people that are back home? There are some families where all the children have left. The nieces have left, the daughters have left, the sons have left. Just the parents are remaining. In Nigeria, I can tell you for free that the family structure, the way we knew family is no longer the same. I can tell you for free that in the next 10, 20 years, oh my God, I didn't even want to even say it. Cousins, we wouldn't, that close family knit, you know, that, that close family connections that we have, we may not have it because a lot of people have left. And so there's a lot of social deficit. So now my question would be that for those people who are in Nigeria, who've had their families relocate, how do we process the mental health? How do we look after our mental health? Because there is a problem as well. Dr. Jeff. Right, okay. Um, <laughs> there, there is one thing in, in um, if you look at a very long-term picture, all these social changes are happening, not in Nigeria, in all countries. So people, you know, what were close-knit communities where people might have lived all their life, had social networks quite stable. People have already been moving to larger cities, you know, your Lagos, your Abuja. Mm -hmm. you know, and that and similarly, the same thing has happened in, in say, more industrialized countries. There's a process of industrialization. It's the same thing happening in China. People are moving. And what you do find is that, um, well, what are the social support networks to look after the elderly people, you know, say back home? Because mm -hmm. that younger social capital are moving to ah. bigger cities abroad. And um, whilst as in generations gone by, the people that raised their children, that was their support network, almost their pension. Mm -hmm. And that is, go that is going. So um, the security they had with the family growing around them, you know, like that's go. you know, it's all that, that's going. Um, and then the message of um, the role models for the younger children going up, it then becomes the, when you grow in the village, you move to the big city, you know, you, you, you see what I'm saying? And at the same time, those people moving to new countries abroad, say they have their children. What happens to them when they get old? <laughs> there isn't that, or at least they have to build that social network and the social capital to look after them when they get old the friends, the social capital, when their children are being raised to share, share the kind of, you know, the peer group, the child caring, kind, you know, support mm. duties. So it is a bit on both sides in that transition. There's no, there's no easy answer. What you're finding, say, in the, you know, where it's happened longer in the West is almost like all the social capital, the houses that are somebody has the pay, that is all. Then, you, so, sorry, let me go back and explain. So, in the industrial countries where it's happened earlier, what people are finding is in the healthcare systems for the old people. People are now old; they're having to sell up all that they've made, often their house, to pay for the healthcare for them and 
in an old folks' home. Hmm. And often in those old folk homes, it's often migrant people from migrated elsewhere that come in to staff mm -hmm. those old care homes, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you see, it's um, almost so, like yeah. an iterative process. Yeah. 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 But then but then but then their parents back home, who look, who looks after their parents back home? The migrants who are in the migrant the migrants who are in the care homes looking after the host community, <laughs> old people. So who is going to look after their own fathers and mothers? Oh, okay. You know, so that's that's the divide. Uh, Miriam, do you have anything to say to add to that? I, I would say I am guilty of the sin. Like, even though my mom used to be with us when she got very old and became frail, we had to we sent out for seven hours. And at home, all my siblings are on the home, scattered, like most families. So we had to hire carers to take care of her. And knowing you know, the kind of the place, the part of the world we are from, people just eat or be eaten. That's the order of the day. So change carers after carers after carers. Mm -hmm. I'm sure at this mm -hmm. point, my mom, mm -hmm. it's a generalized issue. It's the elderly that are left back home. The carers are used to get what they can get for them. They are there to protect their own interests at the expense of your elderly parents. Yes, we are here, we are taking care of someone else's parent. And the, 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 the care of taking care of the people in the, in the old people's home. Because there's law, there's rules, there are things we cannot turn up to in the Western world. They have to do it diligently. But unfortunately, their own parents back home are not well taken care of. So no, they're not. I think. And and this person has changed the best to take care of this other another person's parents know that their own parents are suffering in the hands of the so-called carers. It's affects them. It is. It affects them mentally. It affects them greatly. Yes, and yes, so, yeah. and, and, yes, and them being a, a, a carer, yes. That shows up with where they, where they would love to be, where they would want to be. So there's limits to what they can do. So like you rightly said, there's, there's economic strain on the mind and, and the family. Right. Perfect. So um, before we get to the solution now on how to protect ourselves, another question I want to ask is, there are a lot of migrants who have relocated and we are saying to ourselves or they are saying to themselves, anyway, I'm, just, I'm going to go back home. So they are trans, uh, they're transcontinental. They are not in their host country. They are not in their country of origin. Like they, they are, they are in, the country, their new countries, but their souls, they they are their souls. And Miriam, you said something yesterday. You said they are stateless souls. Yeah. So we have those people who are stateless, who they have they are they they are from states, obviously, but emotionally they are stateless. They are stateless souls because they are neither in the countries of where they are mentally or emotionally, and all they think about is, or oh, they want to go back to their home countries. Unfortunately, the home countries that they're thinking about is not the home country that it used to be. So we have people that are that, ha that are stateless souls. And Dr. Ijeoma, how as migrants can we handle that kind of situation? How do we begin to live, you know, 
or so to speak? Um, yes, good question. Um, I'm just thinking often it's that feeling of not belonging anywhere. Uh, yeah, it's to almost like expect it, right? Mm -hmm. So that it's, you, you know, so that it's not a shock and therefore you can prepare for it. One way of thinking about it is using that. Um, the hero story. Yeah, the hero story, but also the transition that your identity changes. So you had an identity in your home country. You know, this is the, you know, the, the man or woman that made the dream. They've gone abroad. They're a winner, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you have this new identity of who's this immigrant? Who's this? They're, you know, we don't trust them. Yeah, um, you know, because um, they would take on the identity of what the host country projects onto maybe someone of a different color from a different country. That that's, speaks what we, English. that's what we call uh, representation and ordering. Yes. Uh -huh. And sometimes if there's a way of that, it's... It needs a lot of um, positive self-talk to, there's a concept they call projective identification. Oh, if people, projective identification. Yeah. So if people see you as bad or, or have all these negative images projected onto you, sometimes the task is to still remember who you are and not behave the way that these projective negative um, uh, judgments on you. <laughs> Somehow it, it makes some people behave that way, you know? But it's almost like remembering who you are, not to descend to where the identity that's been projected onto you. So that's one area, still knowing, you know, who you were, the why you made that journey, that you're someone that's always at the top of the game, but now you're at the bottom, you're still having to climb this ladder. Who, you know, is always remembering that, not as someone who always belongs at the bottom of the heap and should be expected to be trampled on. So that, that's one way. Then from the home country, people are thinking, this guy's entered paradise. What's he complaining of? <laughs> you know? <laughs> So, you know, so it's almost like in one country, you might not be fully understood and thought of as negative. And in your home country, nobody wants to listen to this. Nobody you, you, cares. You're like, yeah. what was it you did talk? Yeah, you you've hit the uh, jackpot. Yeah. You've hit the jackpot. Make it there, No change, oh. What did they talk? You are so, you, is that isolation? There's very few people that. Um, you can share what you're going through that can see both sides, <laughs> yeah? You, you get me? So if you talk to some people, it's like, oh, God, they don't, they'll never get me. They can't see what I'm going through. And then when you go to people from your homeland, they don't get it. They can't understand what I'm going through. So it's almost like you don't belong anywhere. Stateless. <laughs> you're stateless. So, Miriam, what do you have to say about that? Personally, it's unfortunate that the, the, the moment you step out of your homeland and step into the real life, you become a different person into you. Because we are neither here, you're not that person. Neither are you this person. You don't belong, like Jeff rightly said. You can't get it. Why do why do you do it? Let us stay there. Oh yeah. why, why do you go back to where you come from? You feel you're you're trying to make your life the best you can make it here. It's a lot of resistance, it's a lot of a lot of pull of push, and you just feel 
that was difficult. Look, look at the top. No, you're better off where you are. You become a different person entirely. So you have to have this new identity for yourself. Just to, for your own peace of mind and sanity. Be this new person. But bear in mind don't forget where you are, where you are from. Bear in mind where you are going to. Staying true to your identity. Which identity? Very good. So you're saying that we should stay true to our identity and know that and keep in focus of where we're going. Yeah, because we're going to be all right in the end. Okay, so thank you very much for that. Now, just quickly now, if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, please subscribe. It's Ibinabo Enebi. And you can follow me on my social media handles, Ibinabo Enebi LinkedIn, Ibinabo Enebi TikTok, Ibinabo Enebi Instagram, Ibinabo Enebi Threads, Ibinabo Enebi, where else? Well, that's it. So please follow me on my social media handles. And if you haven't yet subscribed to my YouTube channel, please subscribe because by subscribing, you're helping my channel to grow. So guys, we've talked about the setbacks. We've talked about the, um, you know, the challenges on both sides of the divide. We've talked about the emo emotional, we've talked about the mental. Now let's talk about solutions. Yeah? So as a community, how do we protect ourselves? And the reason why this is so important to me is this, or rather to everyone who's listening is, I mean, there was a study in Canada that suggests that people that are from ethnic minority communities are less likely to have support for the mental health. Yeah. So if we're less likely to have that follow on support, then how do we protect our mental health? So Mary, I'll start with you. Thank you. In, in protecting our mental health, that is why all of us, I can come out to the other end, so to speak, and, and, and that are in this helping profession. I think we owe it to this larger group of migrants to be there for them, to give them what we, we didn't get, even though we continue to get everyone their own people always have this right at the end of the different. But we shouldn't consider how we got there. We should consider the community, the greater community, the greater good. Because when it's one, it's one. It's one. one education. This immigrant has to be educated, re educated. Regardless what education and level you attain before you came, the fact that you find yourself at the bottom. So, and as therapists, I say we should be open minded, I and mean, we are open minded. We should be more inclusive. We shouldn't be money driven. Because when you're money driven, you will not do anything for free, you will not do anything for the reducement. You need to. Be there, and for this person, let's take, let's take a black person coming in through the door, and we when they come in, and we meet another black person on the other side of the room. Like, this person gets me. And chocolate box, this person gets me. In itself, is therapeutic. It eases the person coming in through the door. Those doors, and when they sat in, you know, in the space, they are able to open up, and we should be able to get what they need, which is 
soft words, encouragement. And as far as the health is concerned, direct them in the right path. Say, do this, go to this place, seek this, Google this, do this and that. This is educating them, telling them, showing them the right path, directing them in the way to get every help they can get. Because trust me, this host countries don't want you to know anything, don't want you to have everything. Don't want you to say anything. It is now up to us to communicate that we led in the community. We owe it to them to direct them in the right path. And we owe it to them in good time to make sure their mental well being is looked after. And when this happens, everything else will fall in place. Is well with health. You can think great and then decide, you know what? I want to go back to college. I want to go study. I want to be productive. I want to pay my taxes. I want to achieve this. I want to achieve that. And there will be an example too. A lesson. Because you can see this example done on strife in the human example of the next person. That's my view on that. Fantastic. I, I, the audio was, I was just trying to strain myself. Okay, thank you very much for that. Now, before I ask Dr. Ijoma, I would like to say to my audience that if you have any questions, uh, just feel free to type your questions. If you want to ask any questions, uh, feel free to raise up your hands and I will get you to ask my guests the questions. So, Ijoma, what are the tools that we need as a people to heal ourselves? Right, right. Okay, good, good. very good question. I'm trying to structure in two ways. Um, the, the first thing is um, groups are naturally healing. Yeah. Um, Dr. Jemma, your your audio it. now. Oh God, is it going Something up? has changed about your audio. Oh. There is um. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, that's good. I hope it's okay. Right. Uh, no, I, I hear a scratchy sound. Oh. Oh. I'll just get any electronic devices of way in case it's interfering. Is, is that okay now? It's still scratchy. Is anyone else hearing the scratchy sound, or is it from me alone? I don't know what it is. It's, not... it's okay. You just okay. Let's just uh, yeah. go with the flow. Sorry. Um... Do you have any other device on? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to push all the devices away, just in case it's interfering. It, is, how does it sound now? Is it clear? No, there is um, an echo. Is there still you have another device on? Is your yes, I've got about two other devices on. But it was working well. I don't know what happened. No, I don't know. I just wondered if I... Okay, I'll just give you time to uh, to just sort it out. Yeah, Take I'll your time. Just... And I'll just uh, check. Whilst... No, just... Yeah. So while we're waiting for Dr. Jemma, while we're waiting for Dr. Jemma to to try to figure out that sound, uh, does anyone have any comments? Does anyone have anything to say? Yeah. Any questions? Okay. Dr. Jemma. Okay, we're, we're back. Yes, to can you hear okay. me? Yeah. Oh, better. Is that better? better? Oh, thank oh, God. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Um, where was I? I think the question was... Um, said the community heals Yeah, itself. community. Yeah, so why I wanted to say, the, the, if we focus on the word community, then groups naturally heal. Often when somebody migrates, it's the isolation. Yeah, so... You can say, is the loneliness that's the killer? Hmm. If 
they are able to find a group, a welcoming group, then that helps. It's really, and that's the whole genesis of group therapy. They found that after the Second World War, so many battle conflicted, you know, battle combatant wounded soldiers in military hospitals, not enough therapists, yeah? So they just put them in groups and then people noticed, oh, they're getting better. You know, it's all this PTSD. So then people thought, they're getting better. Let's work out how this group therapy works. So is that, so some of the concepts they have is that the feeling of belonging, uh, feeling part of a group, is all these therapeutic factors. You hear other people's stories and they could be similar to yours. So yeah. it's, it's not happening to me. You can share stories. And even in the most traumatized people, it's sometimes, it's someone bearing witness to their account, yeah? So in that communication of speaking to someone else, the whole um, thing about communication is making it verbal, helps the person understand the experience that they're going through. Just that itself is therapeutic. And a lot of therapy is, is, is about that. The person in retelling the story is helping their understanding of what just happened to him. Right. Mm. And then someone else can give another person a different perspective. Oh, tell this story from this angle and then it's a better understanding. So it's all these things that being in a group, just belonging to a group that you feel valued, accepted, have an identity within, counteracts all the negative projected stuff from maybe an unwelcoming host country. Yeah, all that helps. And then for children, there's the, if you use the concept of containing the container, if the adults have a group and their emotions, feelings are contained within the group, then that helps them contain any fears, anxieties within the children. Yeah, so... So it's basically, if you're quite isolated where you are, is the friendships. It's almost like creating your social network structures in a new country. And if there's a group of people that are also migrating that share the same experience, that is helpful. And so sometimes uh, people will create a group that gives people that don't have a voice a voice. And that helps support that community, even if it's fighting for access to education, good housing, whatever, fair wages, all that. And I, I was somewhere and somebody was talking about the importance of networking, even with the host community. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah. It's often, um, you always find friends in the host community. So it's just that uh, people that are willing to help, you know, so often people are carers, you know, there'll always be some people, their identity is a carer. So if you can find someone that will help you, help you settle in, even someone who um, was once an immigrant, has seen all the hurdles, knows all those previous networks, has that role in helping people settle in, introduce them to networks, friends, that's always helpful. Now, the, the thing that I want to say here is that, and I think that Miriam and you agree with me that we're not selling depression, we're selling hope, right? This is just a cautionary tale for you to know that there is an underbelly here. There are challenges here. There is loneliness here. There is culture shock here. Because I believe that if you're well aware of what you're getting into, then you're better prepared to deal with it. And to say that we all survived, we're all survivors. And if we can survive, then you can. But we owe it as a responsibility and a charge 
to let you know that the journey isn't easy. Sometimes you cry. Sometimes you want to go home. But you have to be resilient. And there is this thing about the uh, the psychological capital. The psychological capital, which is hope. Um, optimist, opt optimistic. You have to be optimistic. Um, you have to be resilient. And you have to be, there's, there's an element of efficacy. You have to be confident in your own abilities. And if we all as individuals have these um, psychological capitals and how much bigger can these capitals get when we come together as a group and as a community? Yeah? Yeah, it's <laughs> certainly. Yeah, I think you're, you're spot on. It's almost, um, you're building a coat of armor for the challenge ahead of time. You know, that's what we're here for. A yeah. coat of armor for the challenge ahead of time. Yeah. Now, if you have the opportunity, make use of it. But what we're saying is... Uh, <laughs> Muriel, the last words. If I am the it's not gonna turn out the way you plan. So you just can't you and so try it as you can and just be true, be honest, be upright human being. And everything else is so plan, plan, plan. Dr. Jammer, any last words? Um, yeah, I think people uh, have come here, they're inquiring, they're getting some tips, they're doing their preparation, building their coat of armour. Is that, as you say, that positive mental attitude, that mindset that will get you through, is that thing that, you know, a child, you know, is almost like, um, say in teams that are going through difficulty, is when they kind of feel overwhelmed and not up to the challenge, then it's a downworld defeatist kind of um, morale that goes in. So what the mindset is, is to uh, expect a challenge, have the mindset to say and the positivity that you're going for the challenge. But you have done your homework and your preparation. You've got your coat of armour. So you feel up to the challenge. And that's the difference. You know, it's like sitting an exam when you feel I've not studied enough and sitting an exam where you feel, yes, I've did my practice. How good a mark am I going to get? It's that difference. <laughs> Thank you so much for everyone who's joined us today. Um, I hope you learned a lot. Uh, so next time I would have another guest and this time around, I'm going to talk about the mental health of the migrant woman. I don't want you to miss it now. There's a lot to learn. And the conversation on the Jackpot series is still on. We still have loads to talk about because I, or because I feel that it is my responsibility to give you that coat of armor that you need for the journey of head, ahead. After all, EP Speaks is about encouraging you and um, giving you transformational, transformational information because we feel that our stories and our experiences are the street lights and survival kits for those coming behind us. So guys, I'm going to call you and see you next time. And thank you everyone for joining us today. And just in case you missed it and you want to get some more valuable points, you can go to my YouTube channel, Ibinabo and Navy. It's there. Uh, this interview is there. You can, or my um, my LinkedIn, it's there. Uh, Facebook, it's there. So thank you and bye, everybody. Mwah, 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 mwah. And Dr. Joma and Miriam, I'm going to call you. Bye. Thank and you. thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 bye.